OK. Uh, so I will just state this theorem, which you can use in your life. It's called the Barry SAN theorem. It's proved separately by Barry SAN back in like 40s and 50s. Barry's American, SAN was Swedish, so it was like the World War II days. Communication wasn't so easy back then. Uh, OK, so here, here it is. Uh, let x1 through xn be independent random variables. Okay, so already, first of all, unlike in the central limit theorem, they don't have to be identically distributed. Uh, also, it's not like they're an unending sequence of them. You just have n random variables. That's the common situation in, in theoretical computer science. And let's assume that uh, each of them has mean zero. This is basically without loss of generality because, you know, just we're going to be interested in the sum of these random variables. So you can just translate them all, center them all to have mean 0, and that just adds a constant to your sum, which is easy to handle. And they don't even have to have the same variances. So we're going to introduce a separate letter for each of their variances. So we'll write sigma i squared for uh, the variance of the ith one, which equals also the expected value of xi squared since we're already pre-assumed that the mean is zero for each of them. And we're going to assume that the sum of these variances is one. OK, and this is also without loss of generality, basically, because if it's not one, if it's like six, then just multiply all the random variables by one over square root six. And you'll achieve this thing, and you've basically not really changed your problem. Just multiplied it by 1 over root 6. OK, and now let s be the random variable, which is their sum, which is the random variable we're interested in understanding. And what we want to say is the conclusion should be that s is similar to a Gaussian distribution. s's distribution is similar to a Gaussian's distribution. And that's true. I'm going to write a statement to that effect. That'll look kind of weird, but then we'll talk about it. So then, for all real numbers u, um, the probability that s is at most u is basically equal to the probability that a Gaussian is at most u. Uh, OK, this is a Gaussian. OK, up to a small error. So in the central limit theorem, we just wrote like plus little of 1. But now I'll tell you an explicit error rate. Um, and I guess the easy way to write it is instead do this. So the difference between these two numbers is at most something that's hopefully small. So small. Um, and what you should think of is, by the way, you should think of this as like a known quantity. For every number u, you're like, OK, this is just the probability that a Gaussian is at most u. It's some explicit number that I can ask my computer to figure out. And then you can be like, haha, this quantity is basically the same as that quantity. OK? Uh, let me now say what the error expression is. It's at most some constant times beta. So I said, this is looking a little bit funny, but we'll talk about it. Where beta is going to be an expression where you'll be like, is that supposed to be small? I don't even know. But we'll see it's usually small. Where beta is this thing, sum i goes from 1 to n of the expected value, the absolute value of xi cubed. OK, we'll talk about it. But let me just say that this will usually be small, which will make you happy. And uh, this constant, it depends on who proved it. Barry and SCN now had some constant that was like 7 or 10, or, and there's some error in their calculation, which made it worse. But the ultimate champion of this constant game is uh, Irina Shevtsova, and she got it to be 0. 0.5600 in 2010. This is not important, but I just 
say it for amusement's sake. Okay, so it's a small constant times uh, this beta. Now what's going with this beta? You might even think like, wait, maybe it's big, right? Like isn't the expectation of like a random variable cubed, isn't that bigger than expectation squared? Um, but remember, like our expectation squareds add up to ones. The expectation of like the random variable squared is probably, well, it's a number that's much smaller than one. So maybe we're in the regime where x cubed is usually even smaller. Uh, so let's just do an example where you'll see that uh, this is often small. So, okay, so let's say we want to use this theorem to study coin flips. Let's say to study coin flips, fair coin flips, as we did at the beginning. Um, so to set it up, we would let uh, xi be, just like we did at the very beginning, we decided it was good to look at, instead of sums of 0, 1 random variables, look at sums of plus or minus 1 random variables, and also divide by root n. So we're going to let xi be the random variable, which is 1 over root n, with probability a half, and minus 1 over root n, with probability a half. And that's good, because it's set up for this uh, hypothesis. So it's like we flip n coins, and instead of adding up zeros and ones to calculate the number of heads, we add up pluses, uh, plus 1 over root n's and minus 1 over root n's. And the mean of each of these is 0. And here we have that sigma i squared, which is the expected value of xi squared. Well, xi squared is always 1 over n, no matter what. So it's 1 over n. And therefore, this normalization condition is right. These normalization conditions are exactly set up, like the, the mean of s is 0. And this is exactly set up to make the variance of s equal to 1. So this is a mean 0, variance 1, random variable for sure. This is a mean 0, variance 1, random variable for sure. And the content is saying that actually this one is close to the Gaussian, the standard Gaussian. OK. And great. So now, what is this thing, expected value of absolute value of xi cubed? Well, absolute value of xi cubed is, xi cubed absolute value is always 1 over n to the 3 halves. So therefore, beta, which is the sum of this over all n random variables, is 1 over root n. OK, which is small, as I promised. OK, and therefore, in this particular situation, this particular coin flipping situation, we get you know, probability that uh, s let me call it Sn again. Sn is at most u minus the probability that a Gaussian is at most u. It's real small. It's at most 0.56 over root n. OK, and that's, like a, that's, a, that's some like, knowledge you can really use, unlike the central limit theorem. Okay? And also, like nicely, it does not depend on u. Actually, there's a version of this where uh, you can put something here that depends on u, and it's actually even better, like the bigger u is. But we'll just stick with this version. OK, and let's actually uh, just use this to look back at the more familiar random variable, which counts the number of heads if you flip n fair coins, as opposed to this random variable, which um, adds up these plus or minus ones. So this Sn, as we've written it, it's really, if you think of flipping heads and tails, it's the number of heads minus the number of tails, if you think of heads as plus 1 and tails as minus 1, divided by root n. Because right? you also have this root n factor. Uh, OK. And that's like heads minus tails of n minus heads over root n. 
OK, so it's uh, two heads over root n minus root n. OK, and therefore, uh, mm, s is less than or equal to u is equivalent to heads being less than or equal to n over 2 plus u times square root n over 2. I just invert this relationship between s and h. And notice this is like the mean number of heads. And this is the standard deviation number of heads. So it sort of all makes sense. OK, so if you flip n coins, uh, the probability of this is very close to the probability that a Gaussian is at most u, which is some numerical thing. It's the integral from minus infinity to u of this e to the minus u squared thing, the PDF. And uh, you get these numbers using like your computer calculator. Computer, I guess. Yep. No, they don't even have to be identically distributed. They were in this, the, the example, but they don't in general. In general, like this beta will be small if two things happen. First, the random variable should not be like really freaky. Um, like do weird things like occasionally be enormous, but like otherwise be small. Like, you know, this is like a nice random variable that doesn't go crazy. And the other thing that makes beta small is none of the sigma i's is too big. If the sigma i's are all small, then that's going to make beta small. If like one of the sigma i's is like 0.99, then the sum is not going to look Gaussian because the variance will be dominated by like that one i. And probably the random variable will just look like that one xi. Uh, OK. So let me close by talking about this quantity. Um, because if you know you have a specific number in mind, like negative 3, then you can ask your computer to compute this. And you know it's. Um, this is the Gaussian PDF. This is phi of u. It's you know the area under the curve up to u. And that'll be like 0 0.01 if u is negative three. Um, in general, this quantity is called uh, the CDF of a Gaussian, the cumulative distribution function of a Gaussian, and it's denoted capital phi of u. And the last thing I want to tell you about is, OK, well, if u is some number, like minus 3 or 1.5 or whatever, then capital phi of u is just some other number, which you get a computer to tell you. But what if you want to know the asymptotics of it, like when u is really small or really big? Actually, because we're used to like asymptotics when the parameter is getting big, it's good to also define this thing. Um, called the complementary CDF of a Gaussian, denoted phi bar of u. It's the integral from u to infinity of phi of u, which is the probability that a Gaussian is bigger than u. Somehow this is like nicer to work with. Uh, it's basically the same thing. By symmetry, phi of u is the same as uh, phi, phi bar of u is the same as phi of minus u. The probability that z is bigger than u is the same as the probability that z is less than minus u. Um, so yeah, like that's, we're looking at this quantity out here. This piece here, if this is u, then this is, the area here is phi bar of u. And sometimes it's important to know the asymptotics of it. And since I don't really have time, I'll just tell it to you. Uh, and you can look at the notes for a, a justification. But um, it's very similar to the asymptotics of 
the PDF itself. So it turns out that this thing is asymptotic to uh, phi u over u. OK, well, remember, this is like e to the minus u squared over 2, 1 over root 2 pi. OK, so the probability that a Gaussian is bigger than u is actually basically equal to the Gaussian PDF at u divided by u as u gets large. So you may, may need that in life. And in fact, in general, like this is literally a strict upper bound. And there's like a one line proof of that, which I'll omit, but you'll see it in the notes. It's real easy. And there's a two line proof of this lower bound that it's like uh, at least 1 over u minus 1 over u cubed times 5 of u. And this is all for u non negative. OK, so this is really accurate that the probability of a Gaussian being bigger than u is really, really close to 5 u over u. Okay, so this is a fact you might want sometime. Okay, that's it. So next time we'll talk about Chernoff bounds and such like things.